Right now, trout and flounder love points. And if you can find a point of a channel, that's where you're gonna catch your most flounder. Plus, uh, about a day or two days before a front comes in when it gets real windy out of the southeast is the best time to catch flounder in the fall. When people bring up the name Doug Bird, I'm from a generation that was early 90s fishing, right? And Doug, we didn't have social media back then. You didn't have any other word to spread the word besides who in the community was good at fishing. And Doug's name was the first one that came up. There's a ton of generations of fishermen that came up because of Doug Bird. You know, a lot of guys that are huge names in the business. I'm not saying that Doug brought Cliff Webb up through, through fishing, but he was an intricate part at the beginning of it. You know, Doug, there's a lot of guys, a guy by the name of Bill Stewart, he's not guiding anymore, guided for 25 years. Yeah, I mean, Jim Harmon, Paul Eccleston, there's a ton of names of people that, Robert Zapata, that started down there with Doug. You know, Doug was was the man, you know, he he started, you, I'm saying, I'm not saying that he started the guide business in Corpus, but you would definitely call him the founding member. And he was somebody in, in my generation, because I guided for 20 years, that was, around every day. You know, he was a, a living legend, so to speak, on the water. Doug Bird was one of the earliest fishing guides in the Laguna Madre, and he had uh, come, come down to Corpus, started this guide business, and there weren't a lot of guides in Port Aransas or Corpus or even Port Mansfield or Port Isabel. He was one of the early guides come, that was down. You think about how difficult it is to build a name in fishing today. It's easier because of social media. Back then, you literally had to do legendary status for everybody on the Texas coast to know who you are and been fishing with you or knew somebody that went fishing with you. And if you say somebody built lure fishing in Corpus, Doug's name would be number one. He had, he had a duck hunting operation uh, that ran during the duck season. Back when we used to have ducks, when they're more plentiful, and he uh, had duck blinds and airboats and stuff, and taking people on duck hunts too. Today we're fishing with a good friend of mine, a veterinarian in Corpus Christi named Daryl Ferris, and Daryl and I have been fishing all oh, probably six, seven years together. There's a towel right there, Daryl. He's catching a fish right now, wasn't quite big enough, but uh, we've had started off pretty good morning with. Some flounder. I've taken care of his hunting dogs, and he's taken care of my fishing for him. <laughs> and uh, we've had some really, really good trips out on this bay, I'll tell you. First time I met Doug was, I think it was 99 or 2000. I was fishing a, a bass tournament on freshwater, and my trolling motor went out pre-fishing on a Friday, and the only place to repair it was here in Corpus. And I didn't know Doug at the time. I just, I heard from other people where to bring it. So I, I get there probably about four or five o'clock in the evening. Uh, saw Doug. He said he's going to send a tech to look at it. He comes back and tells me that the trolling motor's half salt water and half fresh water, that it can't be replaced. It's like there's no way we brought this boat brand new, you know and there was really nothing to do to fix it. We, uh, he come back out and told me that they had a used trolling motor that they could sell, uh, that he'd refurbished for like 300 bucks or something like that. I don't, I don't really remember, but I told, I told him, I said, Doug, I said, I don't have the money to pay for that. I was expecting like a hundred bucks. It's probably all I had in my name. And he, uh, he said, y'all just take the trolling motor Whenever you get the money, just come back and pay me. And that was on a Friday. The tournament was on the next day on a Saturday. Uh, I, don't even, I don't remember if me and Bart went in the tournament or if it was just a one-man deal. And we won, whatever way it was, we won the tournament. We came back and paid him on uh, Monday. We won the tournament and he, you know, that's how our relationship actually started. I didn't know who he was when I first met him. No, I, I, I don't even know if I'd even heard his name before, you know? Well, man, my name's Joey Farah. I, I think I moved here from Louisiana in 1981. I was about nine years old on the Tropic Isles in Flower Bluff. And growing up on the bayou there and moving here, my eyes got open to 
real fishing. You know, we started behind the house. Uh, I think when I was about 11 or 12, I got my first John book. So it wasn't had a hand motor on it, it had oars. You'd be surprised how far you could go with oars, especially about four channels down where Mr. Doug Bird was running his guide service at. So uh, our days were full of cast net and bait all night long and waiting under the bridge on Laguna Shores for Doug and all of his guides to come out and he'd give them free bait and he'd tell us where to go sometimes or give us a couple handfuls of lures. So we started hanging out around his house about two, three o'clock every day and kind of listening to stories and fan club because he was, he was the man. I was, I was guiding, I was still guiding on freshwater. Bart was at Falcon Lake. We had a guy give up, give me, we had me and Bart flip the coin to see who was gonna win to take our Coast Guard license. We only had enough money for one guy, one of, one, one of us. And I think I told Doug that. I said, I'm in the process of getting my Coast Guard license. And I took my Coast Guard license, passed, and I would go back and forth. That's how I, well, I would go and talk to Doug after, during, you know, when I was staying down here. Yeah or driving back and forth. And that's when he said, well, when you pass your license, come, uh, come talk to me. And he said he wanted, he told me I could stay at his house and kind of like deckhand for him on his boat with his trips. And once I got a boat, he would start just giving me some of his overflow, you know? And I guess it was probably within a two or three week period after passing the Coast Guard license, I only had, a, I probably didn't even have five or 600 bucks left out of that money. And I was staying at his house and running trips with him and you know, he would give me the tip money and, and I bought a, I, I guess I left Doug after live, I, I don't know how long I stayed with him, probably, it's probably a month. And I finally got, a, a, you know, approved for a boat loan, bought a boat and then just started running overflow of his. We'd ride bikes over to the marinas where they went as well. Got to know him a little bit. He was always nice to us, always giving us lures and stuff. His mailbox had packages under it every day of all the lures they would send him in from all the lure companies back then. As before, sponsorship with uh, local anglers and fishing guides was real big. So for him to have reached out to nationwide companies in the, the fishing industry was big. There was uh, fishing guides around, but it was more of almost commercial. It wasn't sport fishing. And he really opened up a lot of doors for the sport fishermen in this area and guides. He, some of the best uh, fishing guides we have here for the last 20, 30 years worked for Gut Doug when they were coming up. Uh, he was always a smiling character, kind of tough on the outside, but a heart of gold inside, you know. I was living with Doug. Bart was on Falcon Lake and I'd already, I'd already passed my license and was in the process of getting a boat down here to start guiding. And Bart called me on Falcon and said, hey, there's a tournament, I'm on them, come up here, we need to fish together. And uh, we fished the tournament, I think it was the best of Bassin tournament. And it's probably in probably 2000. And after the tournament was over, we went to Redwood Lodge where we were staying and we went inside, probably five in the evening, and took, fell asleep in the trailer for like two hours, came back out, all the rods on our boat, everything was stolen, everything. And uh, I remember the next time I seen Doug, I think it was that probably a Monday, the following weekend, or after the weekend was over, he, uh, he gave me and Bart, I don't know how many, it was just like 20 or 25 rod and reels to replenish all of our stuff. It's all quantum stuff you know, most of his sponsors, but I mean, it, it, that was that was almost a life-changing deal too, because we, we there's no way we could, we couldn't even afford gas money in our boat, much less, you know, replace all that stuff. But that was that was pretty cool. Well, I, I never worked for Doug and everything, but uh, a lot of, there was guides that did work for him and everything, and he developed, uh, a lot of the guides have Doug Bird to thank for back in those days. Um, just not a lot of people guiding at the time, and he was pretty much pioneering uh, the efforts on that, uh, uh, in guiding and everything. Uh, he, had a, he had a large clientele, 
and everything because of it, and he worked hard at it. And a lot of guys have him to thank to uh, bring forth their, their own guide businesses and stuff. You know, Doug really uh, took me under his wing when I started guiding. Uh, some of the people that he set into the business, like Mr. Cliff Webb and Robert Zapata, and a couple other great, Mr. John Mendeleski worked for him for a little while, and those guys extended a hand to me as well. And so when I started guiding, Doug had the tackle shop in Flower Bluff and offered me sponsorships with Zebco, Quantum, Luz, Browning, Gambler, trolling motor stuff. He brought all these. Back then, there was big conglomerate groups that would gather all those products, and uh, we had some spectacular sponsorships. He'll always have a spot with me. I mean, he's the one that, without him, I never would have made it here. There's no doubt. Back then, or I say back then, it's 20 years ago. There was no social media. I mean, if, if guys didn't like you, I mean, you wouldn't make it as a guy. You had to be you know, on their friends list to get their overflow. Otherwise you wouldn't, I mean, you just starve to death. But he made it a little easier for me uh, just because I got a lot of his overflow. And he did that with a lot of other guides too at the time. I mean, it wasn't just me, but he, I, I still felt he liked me more than the rest of them just because I lived with him. <laughs> he, he was definitely a staple for this fishery and people of my generation and before it, he was well known and well respected and, and ran a good business and, and was a great fisherman, a great lure guy. You know, really staple if you're gonna, was throwing lures and, and that's what he did and he did a great job. He did a lot of it on the troll motor, a lot of it. You know, he was, a lot of people learned how to fish the land cut because of Doug Bird, he showed them. You know, prior to Doug, everybody went, went down there that had enough gas to get there. They just anchored up and threw bait. Doug's down there with the troll motor, standing on the bow of a boat, throwing lures at the edge bass fishing and, and, and catching them. So um, definitely, as it goes to status-wise on the water, Doug Bird is a staple in Corpus. There's one. I don't know which one of us is. Yeah, I got a. You got it. If I got, you got the fish? It. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought he was coming after your lure. He did, but you got in my way. He's a good fish. It's all your fault, Daryl. <laughs> I'm tired of this, Daryl. I've told you before, you're never going fishing with me if you keep doing this stuff. I thought he was after your lure, and I was just he trying was. to drill mine in and get out of the way. <laughs> well, thanks for chumming him up so I could hook him. <laughs> That's the biggest fish of the day right there. I mean, he took a swipe at yours, and I thought he had yours, and I would just reel mine in real fast to get out of the way. <laughs> and then when I, when I felt that thump, I thought, oh, I must have your line caught. He had both lures in his mouth at one time. I got him. Got him? Yeah. Okay. Hold on to him. Show him off. Well, Doug was reeling his lure in, and he was just about to pull his lure out of the water, and I saw this fish take a swipe at it, and I thought it hit his lure, and my lure was only about two feet behind him, so I reeled mine in really quickly to get it out of the way, and I felt mine get thumped. I thought I just hooked his line. I didn't know he had my lure. I thought he had Doug's lure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, I just thank Doug for, for dredging him up for me so I could hook him. Look at here, old Doug's gonna get him for Need our grippers, Doug. I left them back at the motel. Whoa! Doug, hey, Doug's you, got that quick release there now. Don't you break my line loose my run rotor, boy. He's, he busted your road runner. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that. All right. Yeah. I what color did you have on there, Jim? You still have that gold one? I don't know if you can see in the mouth there. Yeah. One on. If I can get in the mouth, he's got a big crusher back down in the back, back of his mouth. Stick your finger in there and see if it works. Yeah, it works. I can stick my <laughs> finger in there. Your Roadrunner's gone, by the way, senor. He, lie, he bit the... Yeah, uh, he broke the blade off. He bit off. the blade off yeah. what he bit. But that's a nice... That's about 20, 21 inch. God, I thought you was going to take 21 pounds. Yeah. thought you going to be like some of them other guys I've been seeing on TV. Jimmy? Jimmy? <laughs> is this what we... Hey, Jimmy? Come on, it's your fish! <laughs> yeah. hey, Jimmy, that was almost as large as mine. It was twice the size of yours. <laughs> I have a funny story about Doug. I was sitting one morning at the marina and Doug and I were, were I guess you'd say we're cordial to each other. We were never in the same circle. You know, the guy that I started guiding with was Bill Stewart and uh, he had a lot of great Doug Bird stories. He worked with him for many years. Um, I did not. We were sitting there at the marina one morning and Doug was, you know, asking me how fishing was going and I said, well, you know, Doug, been good. I'm catching a lot of big trout, been waiting on him. It's been, it's been a good deal. 
you know, it's been going well. Oh, okay, that, you know, that's that's good. That's good. Nothing bad to say. Um, I run down a bath and get it, jump out in the water with my guys, and it's been good. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. Next thing I know, I look back and there's a lake and bay out there on the flat. I'm looking at Doug, going, "What what is he planning on doing here?" And I literally hear him tell his guys, "I don't know where the trout are, but just walk towards Kevin there that direction." And I'm like, "Great, this is not good. I got Doug following me now." I'm, I remember uh, Doug did not like his picture taken with fish, so it was so hard for people to really take still photos of him. He, He'd hold the fish and he'd hold it away from the camera a little bit. Oh, that's a good one, and chunk it in the water. <laughs> and uh, I was always hearing, like, you know, around the dock and stuff over there. It's like, oh, you're trying to get a picture of Doug. And when I would see a picture of Doug, it'd just be of a you know, small fish that they caught him as he turned around candid. He, he was funny at, once you got to know him. Uh, at first, I thought he was a dickhead. Just He was straightforward about everything. Yeah. I mean, he would he would just tell you straight up how it was, and but after I got to know him, I knew it was just the way Doug was. It was kind of, it, it was kind of, he was, it was there was humor in it, but you had to know him to get the humor. I remember we had stacks of Quantum and Zebco Browning lures and rods, and uh, I kept saying, "Man, Doug, I don't know what to do. How should I clean these?" He says, "Well." In the afternoon, when you get home from fishing, just take all your reels and dunk them down in a five-gallon bucket and do them dry. So I kept doing that, and about every week or two, I'd have to bring them in and say, man, Doug, they're sticking again. I don't know what's wrong. I'll just leave them here. I'll clean them. Said, well, how much does it cost to clean them? Seven dollars a piece. All right. Well, I was spending a heck of a lot of money getting my reels cleaned. I didn't know what to do. And then finally, somebody on my boat started laughing at me and said, I think Doug's got you going because every time you stick it in that bucket of water, it's taking the grease out. He just you know, opens them up, puts the grease back in it. So <laughs> it went both ways. Yeah. That was pretty funny. Some dinger. How big do you think he is, Doug? Uh, I'd say he's three, three and a half. Nice fish. We'll measure him here in a second. And... <laughs> And uh, right there. Yeah. 21 and a half. And a half. Yeah. It don't get any better than fish in Texas. This is what it's all about. I know the first time I ever, the first trip I fished with him, we were on tide gauge and it was a guide trip. And I'd caught, we were throwing Mansfield Maulers, and I caught like a, I don't know, probably a 15 and a half, a 16 inch trout. And I grabbed it and took it off the hook and threw it back in the water and he jumped my ass for throwing it back. It was a keeper. <laughs> I just thought it was too small. But. Or, you know, whether people liked him or didn't like him, that's personal preference. But, but as far as what he did fishing wise, he did very well. You know, he was throwing lures. He was down there, had a houseboat down in the, in the land cut down there, nine mile hole, running duck hunts and doing all kinds of stuff, you know, on the outdoors. And being a guy that wasn't originally from Texas is pretty extravagant. But I mean, I, I, if you ask me, what do you remember about Doug? I remember Doug in that lake and bay. I remember Doug in that lake and bay during the winter, running down to the cut with his beanie on and just rocking and rolling, you know, and. He was bringing people here to fish and experience the, the great untouched wilderness of the Laguna Madre and Baffin Bay that echoed throughout the next four or five generations of people guiding and fishing here in the coastal bend. You know, those, uh, those folks from up north eventually invested here and their contacts kept coming even long after Doug stopped guiding. So he, in all that aspect, he brought the business here. Yeah, Doug, Doug was very instrumental in bringing forth uh, new products and stuff and testing stuff for different companies and stuff. Yes, he was very instrumental in it. He was a great fisherman, knew what he was doing. And uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, that we have today is stuff that came out of uh, the stuff that uh, Doug was testing with companies, so. Handy little suckers for wintertime fishing. I want to see what the water temperature is. Sometimes it gets too cold and it makes me go to a different spot to fish. For instance, if this water temperature was 55, 50, 55, I'd move to deeper water than what we're fishing right now. 
the flats over here on the side when the sun gets up by this afternoon it may be in the 70s or up to 70 degrees in the flats yeah there was a lot of people that try to be dug there was a lot of people that I mean, there's a lot of regular anglers that went and bought lake and bays and went, and there's still to this day, there's people here in Corpus that have a lake and bay that go fishing once a week and drive down and fish the stuff Doug fished every day. They still do it to this day. You know, that generation's an older generation, older than me, but they, there's still people that go do what Doug did every day to this day. They still do it. You know, it's pretty phenomenal to see. I see it all the time because they have lake and bays, so it's pretty normal, you know. He also brought a lot of, uh, innovative angling techniques from freshwater in that you know trolling motors hard baits things like that before Doug in this area it was uh, pretty limited to certain lures and certain techniques you know he was a uh, he was real influential on bringing those companies with those lures here as well and then later as you know he started a tackle shop and you know, set all of us new guides up with sponsorships and different things. They just love big trout. He uh, he would always fish. I know he'd start in two two different spots. It was either one spot or the next spot every time I went with him. It was like tide gauge or the or blacks on the south shore line, and he would always start with uh, like crankbaits, uh, mirror lure crankbaits. But he, that's all he ever really cared about. You're on the gills. Okay. I'm afraid I'm going to get... Uh -oh. Now, let me show you. Let me show you how to you hold them. Okay. Okay? Let him flop a little bit, because he's going to flop. And then get underneath his gills here right. and gently hold them that way. Okay, he's bent your back hook, Alan. All right. Uh, get the pliers and straighten it out. Either that or we'll get another lure. A lot of those guys fished with Doug back in the day. They were customers and clients and, and enjoyed it so much that they still do the... I'm not saying the exact same thing, but the exact same thing. Still fish the same spots, still throw the same lures, still do the same program, get on the troll motor down and, and get to casting and winding. And, and that means a lot. I mean, that's how much it affected their life off something Doug showed them that they still do it now 40 years later. You know, they're still up, you know, they're in their upper 60s into 70s and they're still doing the same thing Doug taught them to do. That's, that's pretty epic. He, uh, he was guiding for a long time and he, he taught me certain things. I remember looking down the shoreline and seeing this boat high out of the water, running way up shallow on the south shoreline of Baffin. And he was just curving back and forth and going along through these rocks at Los Corrales. And it was a big V-bottom boat. And I was like, oh my God, that guy's gonna hit some rocks. He come around the corner and I said, man, uh, he knows where he's going and what in the world. Comes by and waves as Doug in a new boat. He was driving this big old V-bottom through the shallows just curving around those rocks and I always thought you know that's how I want to mentally picture the water he he didn't see the surface he looked at the water and saw the bottom he memorized the bottom the surface was extra but he knew what was on the bottom and then he built up to the surface so if he was looking he knew what the bottom was over there and the vegetation, the rocks, and all of that. And then he could see the way the water was flowing, the wind was laying, and the bait was flicking. So he started from the bottom up, and that's really how I look at the bay too, from the bottom up. You know, I didn't know nothing about saltwater fishing. It was just what I, what he had taught me, and you know, probably, probably a dozen trips I'd been with him. Um, the things he got to see and got to do a lot, some of the other guys like Bill Sheikman, and people were around in the, in the 80s guiding and the things they got to do was pretty phenomenal. You know, when I met Doug, I didn't, I had no clue who he was. It, the first time I went to his house, he showed me, and I knew Quantum was big when I started. And uh, he took me into his office and showed me some rods. It said Doug Bird Edition rods on them. And I was like, damn, you are, you are somebody special. You got a rod with your name on it, you know? And then I went back to Three Rivers you know, hung out with the guides there, and they were like, yo, you met Doug Bird. He's like, like, Bill Dance in saltwater. I was like, no shit, I just met him. And I, he, you know, he never told me what he what really was, but I come to find out later on, it was, it was really badass to be with Doug Bird. You know, especially live with him and learn from him. It was, uh, it was cool. But he really taught me how to see the Laguna Madre and Baffin. And not only that, just countless hours 
of little bits and pieces of information he'd give me while we were hanging out behind his house when they were cleaning fish on fish movements, migrations, and what they were eating. And he, he wanted to know the whole story. And that's, I listened to every word, hung on every word. So he really truly was uh, a hero and a legend to not just me and my generation, but to the generation before me and sport fishing the coastal bend and Texas as a whole, really was. Doug Bird was a great fisherman. He was, a, he was an inspiration to many people, myself included. He was a mentor to, mentor to me. He, uh, without him, I never would have probably made it in this industry. You know, I, gotta, I give 90% of, uh, of my career to him. I don't, he, uh, you know, I wish I would have spent more time with him in his latter part of his years. You know, I think if we take it for granted, I took it for granted that he'd be around forever. I don't really know. I, I just wish I would have spent more time listening to his stories more. He was a he was a good person. I wish I wish he was still here. You know, I think that if you judge a book by its cover, you're not doing any any justice to Doug. You needed to open the book to see who he was. You know, and I, I'm it's sad that a lot of us as as men don't always be the person that we need to be around people we, we you know close ourselves down or you know stay in our little show and I think Doug probably stayed in his show a little bit around around some people and uh, maybe came across you know differently than a lot of people but everybody's their own person and open the book and if you'd opened his book you'd enjoyed it he was a good fisherman he was a good outdoorsman and he was a good thing for the sport of fishing especially here in Corpus Not the mighty Mississippi, not the sunshine in LA. It's not a snow capped Rocky Mountain on a warm summer day. It's not the glow of a full moon shining in the night. There's nothing grand about a canyon that holds a candle to your sight. The most beauty that I've seen. It's you, ooh, ooh. it's you, ooh, ooh. it's not a trophy on the mantle, or that raise that was overdue, it's not a wish that has been granted, but being freed by truth, it's not a winning scratch off ticket. Never need more It's not getting through the hard times Being better than before Nothing beats the feeling So nothing else will do The best thing that's ever happened Is you Didn't have a clue, but now I see it clearly.